This is One on One. There he is, Don Katz, founder and CEO of Audible. And let me uh, let folks know, Audible was founded in 1995 by Don as a destination and daily literary, literary service for very serious readers who wish they could read more. Um, you guys are the biggest, the world's largest producer of audiobooks. Yeah, and distributor. And distributor. <laughs> when did this idea come to you? Uh, you know, this idea, I was a writer for 20 years. I was one of the original Rolling yeah. Stone writers. I wrote a lot of books. and. Uh, I used to jog uh, listening to audiobooks. And make a long story short, I was supposed to do a book about the digital media revolution 19 or 20 years ago, when there really wasn't a story to tell. And um, I basically thought it would be interesting if you used emerging new technologies mm. to allow people to download um, to a digital device that didn't exist, which we invented, which is now in the Smithsonian. We, four years before the iPod, out came in the Audible mobile player. And I thought, It'd be interesting to, uh, you know, take a little uh, detour from my writing career and sure. start a company. I thought one book took five years, one book took six years. How long could a company take? And uh, it's taken on a life of its own. There's millions of customers. It's very global. And um, it's exciting. Even uh, Autumn is a customer. She came out. She's a, Autumn, the artist who yes, was on Autumn, the artist. And there, there was the app. And she's on her 11th and Lemony Snicket book. So it's listening. It's and listening. You know, so, Natalie, yeah. Natalie Sandy, our producer, you have right. it as well, right? Natalie has it as well. She just showed it to me. You know what's so interesting? You talk about the global piece of this, but the other part of it, which is fascinating to me, is that, is that you have this strong North connection. Our mutual friend, Mark Burson, <clears throat> was talking to me about you in a conversation. We were having this whole conversation about Newark and, and who's committed. You guys came to Newark. Your operation came to Newark in, I believe, 2007. That's right. You had 125 employees. Now you have like 600. Yeah. Why Newark? You could well, be anywhere. There's a, there's a lot of reasons. So, you know, we were out and we started in Montclair, went yes. to uh, Wayne to a uh, you know, shopping mall kind of headquarters, and we needed to move because we were growing. Um, we also needed to move because we wanted access to the actors who began, you know, to make our audiobooks. But the fact is, I'd become Newarkized. Um, I was on the original, I'm an original board member of Uncommon Schools, a tremendous right. charter school system. You're big into education for reform. North Star, yeah. you're very helpful exactly, too, right? Exactly. And on top of that, I'd met this guy over a dinner when he was still in law school named Cory Booker, <laughs> who had this vision for Newark. That'll and, do it. Uh, but the idea really was, to, how could, could you move um, an aggressive, um, mi missionary, visionary company that likes to disrupt and change people's lives into a city and wed that mission with the turnaround of a great American city. And it was, um, it's turned out to be a fantastic experiment. We literally recruit people because of how we roll. Um, you can only be an intern at Audible if you're an inner city kid. We have, we well, are a paid intern. We have Audible scholars in college and mentor systems oh, around. What are the, Audible scholars? Audible scholars are the, some of the North Star kids or, or public school kids who've done so well that we give them money and support them. They get guaranteed jobs when they're back uh, back at Audible. And they're really part of the whole corporate uh, culture. They have to go through the human resources environment, very hard interviews. They're, if they can't perform, they're put on performance improvement plans, mm -hmm. just like regular employees. And uh, it's just been a, a tremendously kind of uplifting part of the, cult of the culture. And on top of that, we, we go to the, all the events. We, our softball team plays at Newark Bears Stadium. We've kind of integrated. We get tickets to everything. Uh, and it's, it's become a really important part of, of our culture. And um, I'm on the Economic Development Board and yep. trying to be part of uh, the rebirth of a city that's got, as you well know, great bones, great history, Absolutely. and um, you know, deserves to, to come back. And it's, it's been a great experiment for it's us. It's inter interesting as a corporate executive, as an entrepreneur, um, doing what you're doing. As I listen to you talk right now, a lot of it's about education, a lot of it's about young people, a lot of it's about the economic, um, forget about stability, but viability and the future of the city of Newark. Is that, do you see that as part, I hate to be overly philosophical, but I talked to John Strangfeld at Prudential about this as well. He talked a lot about what we don't do for our veterans and he spends a lot of time talking about that. Here's my long-winded question. As a CEO, beyond the bottom line of your company, you spend a lot of time thinking about these things. A lot of time doing it. It's, the fact of the matter is economic institutions ought to have hearts and souls. They ought to have missions. They ought to have values and systems of, of understanding. And the reality is in a city, what you realize um, when you get into it is that most of the people who are political leaders are on something like a two-year cycle because they're kind of running again. And a lot of the agency heads are they're in Newark here. They might be in Baltimore here. 
the business community tends to be quite consistent. And um, the other thing that about Audible, which is a big part of Amazon now, uh, we all think the same way. We work backwards from a longer vision. And one of the reasons I didn't want to be a public company, so we were in NASDAQ for, ten, for almost right. 10 years, was that you have to go very short term. So it, you know, Newark isn't going to turn around completely after 50 years of deprivation right. um, in, in, a, in a minute. But the kinds of commitments and, right. uh, and th things like that you can make. The other day I kind of threw a speech out in an op-ed page piece that basically said that we've got to change our thinking about attracting technology-driven businesses because we're developing all this new human capital right. of kids who not only will graduate from high school, they're in college now and they're coming out of college and there's really not enough of the kind of jobs that young educated people want in Newark yet. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of things we can do, but we have to think a little differently. I mean, don't we have a future of your company, your industry is? Uh, basically what's happening, our, our, our average customer listens to 19 books a year. We've taken the idea of a book and turned it into a service you use every day. And our full, only four of 10 of our customers ever bought an audio book. So the whole concept is going away, and basically storytelling is going to be everywhere in me multimedia formats, and there'll be a consumer who doesn't even think about the oral experience or the textual experience, and they'll understand things and learn to read through a different kind of experience that's digital. It's, it's a big change, and it's all coming on. So, so segmenting, fragmenting, saying this is what it is, this is what it's not? doesn't matter. We have a new invention called Whisper Sync for Voice, where you literally you, you read on a tablet, you put it down at home, um, you jump in the car, your smartphone plays you the audible version. It can be Colin Firth or Annette Bening or, or you know, Anne Hathaway reading you a book. You get home, you pick up your Kindle, um, you're reading again. It's, these kinds of things are merging together and uh, you know, the, the old world of media types will be a thing of the past. And it's, it's, it's exciting. It's great for the creator, actors and writers. We celebrate, we, we employ mm -hmm. Tons of actors. We heard. It's great for the <laughs> reader. It's great for the, uh, for the listener. We want to congratulate you on the success of your company, of Audible, but more importantly, frankly, congratulate you on the work you're doing in the city of Newark, particularly on behalf of young people in the city. Thank you, Don. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Take care. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Sun National Bank, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, PSENG, Fedway Associates Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, and by Cone Resnick. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.